there's an acceptability scale of birds and then their relationship and appearance to dinosaurs. And so, like, ducks, they're cute. They're little. They're fluffy. They can be, you know, they're not completely docile, but for the most part, like, the, the ducks. Chickens, especially roosters, start approaching that velociraptor scale, but geese. Geese are just straight-up dinosaurs. And as cool as dinosaurs are, I'm not, I'm not bagging on dinosaurs. I don't want to raise dinosaurs. I saw Jurassic Park. You know, I might look like I dress in Westworld clothes, but I don't want to live in Westworld. I don't want to live in Jurassic Park. So on the scale of, of acceptability of waterfowl to dinosaurs, ducks and chickens are in my safe zone. So of course, that's why my child uh, loves geese. Not she's obviously has her own interests and she's allowed to love what she loves. I always, I think as a parent, you just find it ironic that you're like, oh no, these are cool. And they're like, well, what about this one? And you're like, no Simba, that's the shadow zone. We don't go there. And they're like, shadow zone. So to my goose loving daughter, uh, I'm going to be making a goose themed coat because then maybe she can just uh, live her goose dreams through aesthetics and maybe we don't have to have a goose. So <laughs> uh, speaking of geese, I have used this fabric before. If you are familiar with my YouTube, um, same name, Catherine Stocking Lopez, uh, or under the name of Art Schooly is where you'll find me everywhere online. I have used this fabric before. Um, let me pull it up because it's a delicious. This is the uh, Goose Creek Garden line, and I love it because it's soft, it's floral, it's age appropriate for my wonderful, bright five year old, but it's not too nursery, it's not too babyish. Um, it's got some really great um, just kind of garden prints, but then the star of the show, bring this real close actually up here, is, are the geese. Uh, this whole flock of fantastic geese um, and that comes in three different colorways. I've got the the blue, the cranberry, and this soft kind of bubblegummy pink which is adorable. And so with all of these, uh, Little Sprout and I, we designed a quilt coat together. Um, what we're gonna do, and I'll bring up the pattern, I'm using a hooded coat pattern by Oh Me Oh My Sewing. Um, I have made their dresses before and they turned out absolutely perfect. So I figured on something a little bit more complicated, I would trust them again. So I'm going to be doing um, this cute little pixie hood because it's adorable. And I'm going to be using that as the base for our coat. We will be making it a little bit bigger um, than I need uh, because we will be adding the thickness of all the quilted layers. So. What I gotta do first, um, I have the design, I know where I want mentally all the fabrics to go, what's the sleeves, what's the back, uh, and then we're putting a big quilted patchwork block on the back. Uh, but what I gotta do first is probably the most tedious, which is actually, and this is a, you know, no fault, this is just how it goes, I've got to put the pattern together. So I've got the lovely instructions, and then flick through here. I have about 30 pages of pattern that I need to um, cut out and tape together to actually make all of the pattern pieces because of course I'm making this for a small human. Uh, each piece is bigger than an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. So I'm gonna get started on that. But while I do that, feel free to chat, um, jump on the chat box, ask your questions, and we'll just sit here and just chat for a little bit while I get these ready. turns into an ASMR channel. Thanks for joining us. And So yeah, again, feel free to jump on the chat. Um, let me know where you're coming from. If you're coming from one of the uh, like cottagecore groups that we're in together on Facebook, let me know. If you found me on Instagram, uh, you know YouTube, just shout out where you're from, and I would love to chat.
So I don't know about you guys, but um, I my brain runs about 37,000 miles an hour, and I was trying to pick between a couple projects to do today. And um, because I made Little Sprout's uh, Halloween costume, like, I finished it a couple weeks ago because, of course, you know, when you've got a young child in Halloween, it really starts, like, the beginning of October, and it goes all month because, one, deservedly so, those kids want to wear those Halloween costumes, like, as many times as they can, and two, you know, to fit every trunk or treat, uh, craft thing, you know, photo shoot, pumpkin patch, and you do have to start early. Um, so in my mind, uh, because the costume I got finished, Halloween's been over, which is a little sad as an adult. I didn't do anything uh, too crazy this year personally. Like I, I made a big costume um, and did photo shoots and stuff, but with, you know, the panini still going on, I wasn't going to go out and do anything of my normal fare. Um, so Halloween's been over in my brain, and I'm very sad about that. But of course, uh, <laughs> because Halloween's been over, good old Christmas has been defrosting on the counter of my brain, and it's been asking if it's ready to cook yet. And I was almost going to do a Christmas stream today, and I'm like, no, no, it's not. It hasn't even been Halloween. Like, I need to slow my roll <laughs> and give it two more days. But, uh... If you look at my name, it's like literally in my blood. One of my part of my last name is Stocking, and we do Christmas. Uh, you know, kind of a just a mix of our uh, Germanic roots, and then uh, my daughter is half Latinx, and so we we blend it all together into just you know very solstice loving uh, kind of Nordic American big old Christmas. Uh, Honk and Palooza, and I love it because I love gift giving. I love, you know, being very cozy, very Huga, very just, you know, getting in when the winter, the seasons change, and it's nice to just get in there and get cozy, reconnect to family and friends, make things, and just settle down. Like winter is slowing down, we can settle down, and even though settling down is hard, um, I'm gonna go out on a limb and blame the ADHD for that one. There's still something about like reconnecting to the handmade and just getting very cozy um, as the seasons change. And I love that a lot. Um, so I have a lot of plans for the winter season. Um, and so like I've literally got a project under the table here and it's just screaming at me. Um, but I've got to let Halloween have its time uh, before I jump in on that. All good things in time. As the uh, great Billy Joel said, you can't be everything you want to be before your time, although it's so romantic on the borderline. And that's something that I definitely have to remember to slow down and you know, it's exciting to do everything, and I think as a creative as well, that manic energy can get away from you sometimes, and you've got to slow. And I think that's why winter is one of my favorites, uh, fall and winter, is because even nature is saying, like, slow down. So. That said, though, if you're into cozy Christmas time wintry content, uh, stay tuned. Because I've got some stuff. Which is why I think this was actually a really perfect uh, segue was to make Little Sprout's coat because that's something that is not particularly holiday themed, more so seasonally themed, and it's going to get cold and she's going to need her jacket. So, a perfect transition if I do say so myself. Although because my brain was completely stuck in Christmas mode, I lost my pattern and had to reprint it this morning, but that's okay. Nobody said we had to be perfect.
so I'm about, um, I'm going to say a quarter of the way through cutting out all of these pieces and enjoying this nice scissor paper sound. And then I will take them together. What we're going to do first, though, um, in the uh, process of making this is after the pattern's cut out, we're not actually going to launch straight into our fabric. I'm going to make what's called a mock up. I'm going to make a garment out of uh, what's called muslin, and that's a just it's a cotton, and it's a great fabric for just kind of making a trial garment. And <sighs> I think this is something that a lot of um, sewists go through is this kind of constant battle between, well, do I take the time to make up the entire garment out of a fabric that I'm not going to wear? Is that not wasteful, um, both in time and in materials? Or do I jump right in and just, uh, you know, sink or swim with my good material and just, you know, go with it? Because there, there is definitely a time and a place uh, where it's easier to fix something, start something, make something if you have something to work with. And so I definitely, depending on the material, am a champion for just, eh, just, just start. Like, you, you can't fix what you don't have. Um, but when I'm working either with limited materials or like really expensive materials, um, or it's something that I've never, ever, ever, ever done before, because, you know, experience can take you so far and, you know, faking it to making it, kind of BSing it can get you so far. But there is a certain point where sometimes it is just better to actually make the mock up. Um, so that's what I'm going to do today. And the reason is because. This quilt coat is going to be a lot of work. Um, just making each piece and then, I guess, pause for a second. A quilt, in its truest definition, is traditionally three layers. You've got a backing, which is, again, traditionally whole cloth. You've got your batting, which can be cotton, it can be wool, it can be more material. And then you have your patchwork top. Um, now, again, these aren't the hard fast rules you can have whole cloth you can it, lots and lots of rules but traditionally let's just say you've got your patchwork so your pretty quilted design on top then your batting then your backing and the name quilting comes from the actual act of quilting this project which is taking thread and tying or sewing buttons or sewing decorative and structural lines through those three layers and that's what makes a quilt a quilt um, is the, the joining, the binding of those three layers. And what that does is it gives it that plushness, um, also that strength. What you're doing when you bind those layers is making it so it doesn't shift around. It's what makes it, it like forges it from three separate pieces into one. It brings those together. So that is quilting. That's, that's a quilt. And so coming back to the quilted coat, uh, what I'm going to have to do is for the sleeve, for the for the front, for the back, all of those are going to be, in essence, quilts. And so that's a lot of sewing. And what I don't want to do is make up all these pieces and then go to put it on Little Sprout and have it be the wrong size. Uh, big would be better, but like, what if it's too small? It, it's not impossible to add at that point, but it would be a lot easier when you're doing a fit um, to make it out of you know, just whole cloth, uh, muslin, just regular cotton, get the sizing right, um, and then take your time to uh, make all of those miniature quilts. So like when I'm doing just like a cotton dress or something, I don't really make a mock-up. One, I'm lazy. And <laughs> two, if I'm gonna, like, I'm, I'm busy too. Um, I am a homeschool single mom of a fantastic child. Um, and it just, it takes time. So I, if I'm going to make a dress, I don't want to, you know, there's part of me in my brain that just doesn't want to spend the time making it twice. Um, and then there's also just that part where, and this is something that just comes with experience. I think a lot of times I'll put my whole heart into the mock-up and then I will accidentally cut a corner because my brain's like, nah, man, we know what we're doing. And I'll mess up on the final project. And so sometimes, again, going back to that, it's easier to finish and fix what you have. Um, I'll just jump in on the main project instead of doing a mock-up every time. That's not professional advice. Obviously, please work to how your brain works. Don't try and work to how somebody else's brain works. Your brain is your brain. Um, and if doing a mock-up is how you, you know, how your brain works through things, that's admirable and... I admire not only your patience, but just, yeah, knowing your brain. So, please, do what is comfortable to you. I'm not bashing in any way. Um, 
And that's just also knowing your brain strengths and weaknesses. I um, did a lot of things one way because I thought it was the way you're supposed to, and I struggled. And so I'm not afraid anymore to be like, nah, that's not how my brain works. I need to do it this way. Um, and that's just being, you know, providing accessibility to yourself. Um, as long as it, you know, obviously in this run we're talking about crafting, just make sure that you are accountable for your actions and that you're not using that to justify any harm or anything. But now if we're talking like the difference between making a mock-up or using a pattern or not, like be kind to your brain, be kind. So. Alright, so this is a beautiful pattern. Um, it's really fun uh, to get into a pattern that somebody's developed because they've obviously put a ton of thought into this. And uh, like I mentioned before, I've used this uh, particular small business brand's uh, patterns before. Um, I will throw a picture up on uh, my Instagram again, but there's a gorgeous mushroom dress that I made Little Sprout uh, using Omi Omai's dress pattern. And oh, let me tell you, that dress is so cute. Uh, it even, the dress pattern had a little ruffle that looked like mushroom gills, and so the body of the fabric, or the body of the dress was a mushroom fabric, and then I used the, the ruffle to look like mushroom gills on top, and it was just mycological perfection. Um, I'm very proud of that one. So I am excited to see how this uh, comes together, especially when we add all of our patchwork and really kind of uh, zhuzh it up um, beyond just like whole cloth. So I, I mentioned that uh, I've used this fabric before, the Goose Creek Garden. I made Little Sprout um, her uh, first day of school. Um, I made her a German sweets cone, a school day, and um, the, uh, yeah, German sweets cone. And um, it was out of this Goose Creek Garden fabric, and it was very, very charming and worked very perfectly. And it's nice. It was kind of the trial run for this fabric because. Uh, her Oma, my, my mom, um, she had picked up the fabric just because it had geese and it was perfect. But it's been really fun to just kind of see how many times uh, we can use it without, you know, it being too overwhelming of a motif. Um, but it's very, very charming fabric. And so it's fun to kind of see it again and have it realize its full goose coat potential. So once I get all these cut out, it's going to be like a big giant puzzle and I'm going to stick them all together. Uh, there's a layout. Um, I mean, some people like to tape it all together um, and then cut them out, but it makes a really, really big sheet and I'm working in a very small space. So I like to be a little bit more chaotic and just cut each piece out and then try and figure them all out when <laughs> I have them all cut out. I didn't say it was the smartest, um, but that's okay. There's a picture. Plus, once you start working with enough patterns, you can kind of, you know, get a pretty decent guess of what's what. And then, like I said, there is a an overall diagram that shows what piece goes where. So, not an impossible impasse.
So I am teaching uh, my daughter, Little Sprout, to sew. She's learning from both me and my mom, who we call Oma. So Little Sprout's Oma and I are uh, teaching Little Sprout to sew. Right now she is more interested on the quilt side of things versus the clothing construction side of things uh, as far as her own creation. She, of course, um, and I'm super grateful for this, she loves the clothes that we kind of designed together and I'm able to make because um, I would never force her to wear anything just because I made it. So it's really extra special to me that this is something that she genuinely wants um, because then I feel special. And then it's also just something for us to bond over. But, you know, I also remember what it was like to be a kid and I don't want her to wear something uh, just because I want her to wear it. Um, so it makes me very happy that we can actually share this and she is genuinely interested. And I also love too that like uh, she's still into like the dungarees with the pockets and because we... We are always out there on nature walks, uh, collecting nature treasures. She goes to a little like um, virtual forced school type activity during the week uh, when we're not doing our, um, it's part of our homeschool, but she has a independent teacher and I love that I used to teach for the same company. Um, so that makes me very happy to see her continue in it. Um, and then we do our normal kind of homeschool um, aside from that. but. Regardless, we are always looking for acorns and rocks and sticks and twigs. And having pockets is not only vital to that, but uh, there's part of me that's like, haha, if, if you guys won't give us pockets in our normal fashion, we will make them ourselves. So take that. Needless to say, this coat um, will have pockets on it, which is actually one of the great things is uh, it actually already had them designed, so I don't have to retrofit. And so yay, shout out to Omeo My Sewing for knowing that kids not only need, but deserve pockets. So, bravo. Yeah. And if you guys want to jump on chat too, let me know what you are working on. If anyone, it's a, where I am, it is a wonderful sunny Saturday afternoon, just after the stroke of noon 30. And I am obviously here in the bus uh, working with you guys. But yeah, let me know what you are working on. If you are sewing, painting, crafting, foraging, gaming, I would love to hear it because I love to chat. I was playing Among Us uh, with some friends last night, and that was super fun. That was actually my first time uh, playing that particular game, and it, I, I miss my friends a lot. Uh, so all this virtual connectivity has been fantastic in, in, in making up for it. Like, I can't, again, wait for the day where it's safe, um, you know, once all the kids are vaccinated and everything. But, um, you know, we're making it, we're making it work. I think that's one of the wonderful things about not only humans as we are incredibly resilient, but we will find a way. And so thanks for being here and helping us and me find a way to, you know, connect during all of this. So let me know what you're working on. Oh, somebody had asked me if I was excited for the Animal Crossing update, and yes, very, very much so. Um, I'm ready to have coffee with Brewster, and I, I can't wait to like over aestheticize um, my adorable little islanders' uh, vacation homes with Happy Home Paradise. So, yes, I probably won't be streaming that just because. Uh, yeah. We'll keep it crafty here, and then I'll I play at weird hours. But if that is something you guys want, let me know. Um, but for the most part, I like to play that with uh, Oma and Little Sprout, and we just have a big old Animal Crossing party with, you know, we stay up late at popcorn, make it a make it a night, make it a thing.
if I can geek for a second, um, I'm cutting out this pattern and I'm reading what all the pieces are. And of course that's not only good for familiarity, but also just, you know, figuring out what I'm in for. And uh, this has lovely facings and it's got a bound hem and I'm, I'm really excited about that. Uh, I think when you get really into sewing or, you know, I take that back when you get really into anything, there's definitely parts of a project that are your favorites and parts that are, you know, maybe a tad more tedious. Um, and for me for sewing, um, I like cutting everything out. I don't actually enjoy too much just the base construction of it, just getting everything into one piece. Uh, but what I do love are the finishing details, like bindings and zippers. And partially it's because I'm almost done with the project. If I'm like putting on snaps, it's going to be wearable. Um, and I also think it's part of me just reclaiming the fact that I used to be, used to be. I have a very strong history and I am a recovering hot mess. Uh, I did cosplay for a very, very long time and, you know, I did it for the fun of it. Um, you know, I was in groups and we did contests and stuff, but, uh, and we traveled around and, uh, did a couple guest cons and stuff, but like for the most part, it was for me, it's the fun of the character. It's if it held up good enough for the photo shoot, if it held up good enough to, you know, wander around a con, it was good enough. And, um, you know, you're allowed to mature and evolve. And I think now I'm more focused on like finished garments and things that like, you know, my kid's going to wear, it's going to have to go through the washing machine. I can't, I cannot get away with, uh, some of the stuff that I used to get away with on my own personal, um, construction. And it's, that's character growth, but it's also just, um, you know, just changing and evolving. And so now I think to make up for all the seam finishes and proper closures, um, that I didn't do in my cosplay tenure, I am like hyper fixating on uh, those finishing details. And so those are super, super fun for me. Um, but it does mean I have to actually have something to finish before I can get to that. So in, in my last stream, I talked about the kind of valley of uncertainty and also the bell curve of like, this is fun and this isn't fun, um, which goodness, I want to bring up another graph. Um, <laughs> But there's like this valley where you start a project and everything, like it's so exciting. You jump in, you got the materials, you got the plan, ready to attack, and you're working on it and things are going really well. And kind of when you hit that first road bump, either you, you know, a misstep and you have to rip something out or, you know, either your skill isn't quite where your brain thought it was or just something happens, then you start entering this valley of uncertainty. And I think it happens to even like professional professionals where you know big picture, you have to just keep going to get out of that mountain. But a lot of people give up in that valley of uncertainty because, well, it's, it's hard. It, it really is hard. There's a lot of that, like, why do I keep trying to sew projects when this is, this is hard work? Um, but you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it and be like, it's fine. Just keep going. But like, there is something in that personal journey and that personal growth of learning how to get out of the valley of uncertainty. Um, and one of the mantras I've heard uh, for doing that is uh, making sure something is finished, not perfect. Um, and it's not to say do sloppy work. Um, I think we've kind of desensationalized the word perfect. Um, where we, it's weird. Uh, it's like we both strive for it and it's also not something we can really accomplish. So we shouldn't really even worry about it. Um, a coat that is finished and wearable is perfect in the fact that it's finished and wearable. If I stress out about every, hello, every little seam finish and every little whatever to where it never gets worn, well then it's not perfect and it doesn't matter how good the rest of the coat was or how anything else did if it's not finished um so definitely finish not perfect is something i've been working on and then it also gets me to get to do those finishing details the bindings the zippers so whatever that i'm you know retroactively paying penance and making up for and, and getting excited about for the times i didn't do them and you know that that is that is growth um your first garment isn't going to be perfect i still have things that i made that are still closed with safety pins because who wanted to put in a buttonhole and you know it's just hey I love it I wore it I enjoyed it. it it's not a competition I didn't enter it in a contest it doesn't matter it got worn it just fulfilled its purpose but you know if I had given up it never would have so you know definitely finish not perfect is how we how we fly around here um 
sorry, I'm looking at this pattern and I'm not sure where to cut, so I'm going to come back to that one. Um, because, yeah, something that is useful and able to be loved is useful and able to be loved and just, yeah, don't, don't get so caught up in, oh, it's not perfect, I should stop, or oh, this is, you know, I don't like it, it's ugly, I, I'm not ever going to work on this again, because chances are, if you just get out of that valley of uncertainty and finish it, it'll become something that you love because you can actually give it love because it will be something that you've finished. And a lot of times just the journey of finishing it is absolutely, not, not a lot of times, every time it is absolutely worthy of love. So there's my, uh, thanks for coming to my Ted talk. Uh, but yeah, just, just finish your things because big picture, that's all that matters. Um, not that you are, making things and that your worth is based on your productivity but more if you if you've put the time and you're putting your soul and your energy into something at least get it to the point where you can love it um just by having it be something that you, you know are are proud of in any capacity it doesn't have to be for a gallery show it does not have to be for a shop it doesn't have to even be for the internet it doesn't have to be for anything other than let yourself have that joy in uh, the completion and by making something and you are absolutely worthy of that appreciation so all right thanks for the new followers coming in guys it's great to see you um i am cutting out a pattern for a quilted coat so if you're just joining us i am piecing together the paper pattern so that we can then cut out our mock-up and get to sewing and as i am doing that we are just chatting so Feel free to jump on in and chat. Uh, let me know what you are working on and uh, get cozy. Here in a second, I'll get up and actually grab my coffee that I left on the other side of the studio. And uh, we can have a sip of coffee together. Speaking of studio, if you are just joining us, um, my name is Catherine and we are in Art Schoolie. Art is a school bus. He is a decommissioned bus and I reclaimed him. And together we are Art Schooly, and uh, this is where I do my art practice inside a small, um, Art is a shorty, he is a short bus, um, like a six, one, two, three, four, five, six, six window long, uh, little mid bus, and I am very, very happy and very honored to not only kind of recycle something as big as a school bus, but to have a really special and unique place to do my art practice. So. Welcome on board the bus. Uh, we say around here, the bus's doors are always welcome, are always open, and you are always welcome. And uh, that is true. It, we are a safe space here. We are, we, uh, you know, no hate, no discrimination. Very LGBTQIA plus friendly. So please come on in and join us. Oh, sweet. I'm getting down to the end of this. So our paper snipping ASMR will be coming to an end. So uh, make sure you get enough of that. And also, um, if you are coming from like my Instagram, let me know if you're coming from one of the cottage core groups um, on Facebook that we're in together. Shout that out. I love seeing familiar faces and names. It makes me really happy. Hello, hello. And uh, that way I can make sure to give your content a like as well. Um, That's one of my favorite things about all this virtual connectivity is I've been able to meet some incredible artists and makers and just incredible people in general. Um, because people that make cool stuff and that are, you know, even if making good stuff means making good connections, people are, people are just really making some cool things and it's really, really great to connect uh, with like-minded kindred spirits. So let me know where you're coming from. And on that same note, if you are just meeting me for the first time, again, I am Catherine. We're in Art Schoolie. I am in Southern California. It's very hot here and it is a sunny Saturday afternoon. So wherever you are viewing in the world from, welcome. You are very welcome here and I'm happy that you've joined us. Perfect. Look at that. 
All right, I reached the last page. This one's just the sizing guide, so I don't have to cut that out. And I'm excited about small bonuses like that. I don't know about you, but there's that looming thing of seeing like a giant pile of work and you're like, oh man, I still have so much left to do. And then you like get to it and the last couple pages are just like instructions or blink. And you're like, ah, oh, yes, sweet, sweet bonus gift. I don't have to actually do this. So <laughs> yes. not afraid of hard work. Just sometimes it is very nice to have a kind of surprise like, oh, I didn't have to actually do that. Yay. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to get a little bit more reorganized here. Um, put on my beautiful fabric aside just for a second because I have got to tape together uh, this pattern. And so I'm going to lay it out like a giant puzzle. And my stuff. All right. Hello, everybody. Follow this diagram where I have all my pieces. You can see how many gorgeous pieces this has. And I don't need every single one, um, but most of them. It's mostly the two hood types that I don't need. So it's going to be most of this. So we're going to make a puzzle right now. And if any of you are professional pattern makers, professional sewists, you are probably screaming at me in the comments because I didn't tape them all together, but I was explaining that I like to cut each piece out and then make it a giant jigsaw puzzle. Uh, whether or not that is the quickest, smartest, fastest way, um, it gives my brain something to just kind of cool down on before I jump back into something. Uh, and sometimes you need that. Sometimes you need just something that's a little chill before you get into it. And after all of this uh, cutting of this paper too, I need to give my poor wrists just a hot second <laughs> before I cut out more fabric. So this gives me a minute. What I also like to do is grab a pen and mark off the pieces that I have already connected because then I'm not looking around for a piece that isn't, isn't there. So. Okay. so again, yeah, while I'm while I am doing this, feel free to jump in chat and let me know what you are working on this lovely afternoon or whatever time it is in your local time zone. So you can see that I am joining all these pieces. Uh, what this does is because I am working on a garment for an actual small human sized human, um, I needed bigger than my eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper and so that's how I'm able to get these um, and again this pattern was written by the lovely oh me oh my sewing and so their website is oh me oh my sewing dot com uh, feel free to check them out I'm not sponsored or anything I am just a big old fan so you know it's good when it is good when you know you find a small creator that you jive with and I really do like working with their patterns so that's been working out really well for me.
as soon as I get this pattern uh, cut out, terrible posture, there we go. All right, after I get this cut out, what we're gonna do is um, lay it out with our plain fabric. I mentioned that we are going to be making a mock-up uh, today just because of the nature of of this project and if you're just joining us this is a quilted coat so each piece is going to be uh, like a miniature quilt and then it'll make a big like a wearable blanket um, when it is all finished and because of that I want to make sure that uh, that fits correctly um, on the intended wearer before I make like 16 little miniature quilty pieces and then have it be too big or too small. Too big would be better. Too big we can salvage. Uh, too small would be pretty catastrophic. So we're going to make a mock-up um, and go from there. And just in case you were wondering what did take so long, this pattern did print out on 32 individual sheets of computer paper. Um, and so it's just a little bit of a jigsaw puzzle to put back together. That's how it how it is. That's nothing unusual and definitely not a critique. Because um, you can either get patterns like from like Simplicity and Vogue and all them, and they will be on the big tissue paper. Um, or if you're buying digital patterns, they you print them yourself and you make them um, out of a puzzle like this. So two for one content. You get a jigsaw puzzle before you start your sewing project. Which sounds really silly, but it actually is kind of exciting, so don't judge me. We are big puzzlers um, in this family, so maybe that's not surprising why I love this. So. <laughs> One of those tell me you're a big giant nerd without telling me you're a big giant nerd. So it's, what I like to do is start with all the like big obvious pieces because that's easy um, and then work my way to the smaller pieces. And you can see on the pattern layout like where stuff goes so it's not, uh, it's not impossible to put together. It's just, it just takes a second. Like I said, you, you could have taped all the pieces together, but when, if you're like me and you're working in a small place, sometimes taping 32 pieces of paper oops, together and then cutting it out is a bit much. So you either choose jigsaw puzzle or you choose um, giant piece of paper. So make your poison. One of the things I like to do is, um, if I know that the pieces overlap, I like to leave extra computer paper um, on the sides. One, it's less to cut out initially, and two, it gives you something like a backing uh, to tape onto. So I'll show you on this one, um, where I left the margin there, but cut this one clean, so that when I join them, it has more stability instead of having to just join kind of on those two black lines and have it be a little floppy. Because these are gonna get some some love and if I've taken the effort thus far to do all this I do want it to uh, to hold up so that helps Oops, that's the hood. Um, and again if you are just joining me uh, this is the picture again so you can kind of understand what all the chaos right now I'll, just, I'll put that there so you can see that we're making the pixie hood version of this quilt coat Again, not sponsored, just a fan, but this is omiomysewings.com's pattern. And I am going to be not only making it as a little hooded coat, but I am going to be upgrading it to a quilt coat, which again is like a giant wearable blanket where each piece is a quilt and um, it will be patchwork on the back. Um, I can't wait to show you guys the design. What I did was uh, we went through one of my uh, went went through one of Little Sprout's Oma's patchwork books, and Little Sprout and I picked out a couple blocks, and then I took them into uh, Procreate on my iPad, and let her pick what fabric went where, and she drew all the little geese, and it was very very sweet. So I will put that up on the stream um, when we get to the part where we talk about uh, what we're making. But it's very, very sweet. And yes, it is going to have geese on it. Um, I will relish any opportunity to 
show this sweet fabric. So here are the aforementioned geese uh, for the fabric. So get ready for some goose coat. There's going to be lots and lots of geese in this stream. making a big giant mess, but I'm going to save all my paper scraps. Um, not only is it just something I like to do because I don't like to waste, uh, but also that's what's like absolutely perfect for making, or, you know, paper mache or anything. If you have just a bunch of, um, you know, ready-made paper scraps that are just ripe for the picking, um, you don't have to go cut up new paper. You've already just got paper that you can already use. So, I almost have the whole pixie hood pattern. Um, it's very cute. Very, very cute. I'm definitely excited that uh, Little Sprout enjoys a touch of whimsy because, one, kids really do grow up very, very, very fast. She's already five, uh, and that floors me on a daily basis. Um, but the fact that, like, just let's run around in a little pixie uh, a hooded coat and cloaks and all sorts of stuff it's it's been fun for me and uh fun for you know fun for her and we get to bond over it and it just helps me like remember all the fun things that I either did or didn't get to do and now I can share with her um, and we can just have fun with it and I don't know, there's something about reconnecting or just connecting with the way that kids see the world and um, how they find it just, comp they appreciate the absolutely ordinary that we used to love as humans and now we're grown up and we're forced to, you know, to focus on too many things to where it's not as, you can't just stop and look at a cool rock, but you should, you should stop and look at a cool rock. Um, and I enjoy that I've been slowing down and looking at cool rocks uh, because that's what we could and should and you know we're only on this planet for a short time and look at the cool rocks. So yes I foresee and greatly anticipate um, the nature walks and everything that we will do especially you know in her little coat and at any time that um, I think as a mom that my kid's appreciating something that I made her, um, you know, it's not about my vanity. It's more about like, Hey, she trusted me to do this and I put in the time and she values the time. And then look, there's my baby and she's wearing something I made her. And how incredibly special is that? And I, I'm, I get to connect to, you know, past generations. My, my grandma, she sewed and she taught my mom to sew. And now my mom's an Oma and she's teaching her granddaughter to sew. And it's, it's a legacy. It legitimately is. And that's super duper cool. Um, and you know, even if you didn't have that as a family legacy, there's no, it's never too late to start something. Make it, make it your family legacy, make it your legacy or make it just be something that's fun for you. Like there's no right or wrong in this. Just make stuff because it makes you happy. You know, whatever you get out of it. I say, as long as what you're doing doesn't hurt anybody, go do it. So All right, we are um, probably about halfway through my giant puzzle here. Big brain time. And I almost have the pieces that I need to get started. I don't need every piece again. Um, I don't need the pockets because I'm going to be making my own. And I don't need, th there's multiple hood views on this. I don't need both because I'm only doing the pixie hood. So we're getting to the point where um, I can actually almost uh, lay, start laying this out because I do not need every piece. Which is also something that still feels weird when you're like, yeah, I don't need half of those pieces. And you're like, am I doing this right? Um, Okay. 
All right, I've got a question in the chat. Is quilting like padded? It is. If you've got, um, you know, a really nice quality coat that's got like the down padding, uh, that is similar. Um, in that case, you've got your backing fabric, you've got your feathers and or uh, the quilt padding or whatever, and then an extra layer. Um, I in earlier, and so yeah, you guys get a bonus lesson if you've been here since the beginning. Um, I was talking about how quilting is the act of joining all your layers together. So a quilt will have a back, a layer of batting or padding. Um, it can be down, it can be wool, it can be cotton, and then you have your top layer, which is traditionally where all the patchwork, all the like pretty kind of quilt look things, all the squares and the triangles. And then when you sew those together, you join those three. I don't have three. You join those three layers into one and that becomes a quilt. So like, yeah, a nice padded jacket um, where it's got, you know, layers of stuff encapsulated and keeps you nice and warm, that would be similar. So yes, uh, that's a great question. So thank you for shouting that one out. And yeah, if you guys have other questions, uh, feel free to jump on the chat. Um, tell me what you're working on. Tell me where you came from. And let me know if there's anything I can clarify or talk about. So yeah, you can see I still have quite a few pieces left here. And what I might end up doing is taking all the little pieces uh, and just putting them in a pile and getting to them when I need them. Um, that is definitely a way to uh, kind of minimize the, the chaos here. We're just chilling. I feel like this would be like the world's weirdest speed run. You just give a bunch of people um, a bunch of weird pieces like this. Do people speed run puzzles? Like, like jigsaw puzzles? I feel like that would be a thing. <laughs> I'm just laughing at uh, any percent puzzle speed run. It's just, just the frame. Alright, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort the big pieces from the small pieces, and then um, when I'm doing the sizing, I'm not worried about the facings, I'm not worried about the pockets. Um, the hood may or may not come into play, like if the whole rest of it fits, I might make a mock of the hood. What I'm most concerned about when I'm doing the mock-up, which is kind of like a trial garment, where you make it out of fabric that's not either your your main fabric or your expensive fabric. It's just a plain, plain cotton. You're worried about uh, the fit. So in this case, because this is a jacket, I'm worried about the way that the front sits. I'm worried about the fit in the armpits. And then of course the back, because you know, I'm making this for a kid. I don't want them to be uncomfortable. I don't want them to not be able to like move around. Um, so that's why I'm taking the time to do a mock-up, um, which is like I said, just a practice garment um, before the real garment. And then also because um, it is a lot of work doing the quilting um, and making all of that, I don't want to make all the quilts and then uh, have it not fit. So that's why you would do a mock-up. Um, and so I'm mostly just looking for the big pieces of the pattern, the, the front, the back, the sleeves, 
um, and not worrying about all the gorgeous facings uh, when I make my mock-up. Um, if you wanted to, you, there's absolutely no uh, wrong way to do a practice garment, to do a mock-up, and sometimes it is fun to practice, like the whole thing, like the whole kit and caboodle, um, and try it out, especially if you're doing something that you've never done before, um, like see certain seam finishes or whatever, um, that would be why you would do like the entire project. Um, but if I'm going to, I'm not going to like put in a zipper on a mock-up unless it was something really form fitting, but luckily this is a kid's coat. Um, and so it just needs to make sure that it fits around the armpits, um, and fits well enough to not be restricting and just, you know, actually be wearable. So I'm going to just put my big pieces together real quick here. So the reason I'm actually making a quilted coat, um, you know, besides the actual like utilitarianism of having a wearable garment that is something I made, is I had started making myself a quilt coat. Um, it, it's linen and patchwork and I put a lot of work into it and I, it's definitely something I will finish, um, but it was definitely a, I should have made a mock-up first. I kind of did. I was trying to fit it on the fly um, and just kind of jump in and I hadn't made clothes in a while. And um, then I switched machines, like sewing machines halfway through and the one I was working with started slipping around when I was quilting and it pretty much anything that could have gone wrong went wrong on that project. And I will finish it um, because I want to wear it. It was a quilt coat for myself. Um, but as I was working on it, my daughter, Little Sprout, she saw it and she very sweetly was like, Mama, um, when are you making one for me? And, you know, so then we, we started designing it together. Um, I was very excited. So, of course, I'm taking everything that I learned from mine and making sure I at least don't make the same mistakes. Um, that is definitely something I try and do in my life is I cannot promise to never make mistakes. But at least if I'm not making the same mistakes I've already made, that's growth. Um, so, you know, especially in something like crafting that's, you know, easily seen and easily applicable. Um, but I think it, it um, applies to life as well. Like, no one's perfect, and as long as you are growing and trying, or like genuinely trying and not making the exact same mistakes, I think that's, you know, what we can ask for. So, all right. I almost have the whole hood pattern, and it's very sweet. So again, I'm doing the pixie hood version, which I am just absolutely chuffed about because, again, extra whimsy is extra whimsy, and that's delightful. So, you can see it here. I'm just missing the little curve on top, but you can see how that'll sit on the shoulder, and then come along, have the little pixie point, and then it will uh, curve along the top here. But it's getting there. It feels a lot like I'm doing like pipakura or, or like, you know, some uh, paper craft when I do these parts. And then it's like, ah, you've just started, just started. Um, but it'll come together. It's going to be really neat to see this one. Okay. Aha! This is this piece I was missing. Cool. No, it's not. Just kidding. Yes, it is. Okay. Good lighting. So total on um, this pattern, one, two, three, so there's about 22 pieces um, in this pattern, well, it's just like 25, um, but you don't need every single one depending on which view you're doing, uh, which hood. 
Um, so there's a lot of moving pieces in this, um, which I'm very, very glad in that case that I do have a good pattern uh, because making something up like this is not in the skill level nor in the realm that I'm comfortable. Um, you know, I can mock up a skirt and a dress and stuff, but this has a lot of really beautiful, beautiful detailed like facings and um, it's cute because you can do buttons or you can do those really cute um, toggles where it's got like the leather, the leather, and then the little like wood through the string, which are just like super, like, like Paddington Bear. Um, so they're really like iconically adorable. Um, which is probably what I will do because who can resist those? Um, but yeah, because it has so many moving parts and so many little pieces, I am very, very grateful to have a really good pattern um, because doing that kind of work is, is tricky. I mean, that's why there's a business in an industry and why there's professional pattern makers because this stuff's hard. <laughs> All right, so you can see here that I've almost got uh, this would be the front, so I'm just missing this little chunk. Um, this is the one side of the hood. Just kidding, I lied. This would be the back, so this would be cut on a fold. This is the front. I'm missing just a little armpit. And again, I'm doing this for a five-year-old, so if you're like, oh no, those are never going to fit her, it's true. I am not a five-year-old. But I have an adorable five-year-old, and she is my world, and I love her, and I'm very excited to see her uh, geek out with me over this. So. And that's been absolutely wild, because of course when she was, you know, in utero, it was fun to make things, and then we made her a beautiful baby quilt uh, right before she was born. Um, and then, you know, little little things here and there, and then just motherhood and life gets insanely crazy. And there were lots of things I wanted to make that I just either didn't have the health, the strength, the time uh, to make. And and so that's that's bittersweet because I know, you know, there's there's part of me that is realistic that knows I couldn't have done it all. Um, but it's it's hard, and there is almost a little bit of a mourning for things that you didn't get to. I, I really have that hit with motherhood, especially like before when it was just me, it's like, Oh, if I didn't get to do something, it's like, okay, that's fine. You can't do it all. But they, they really grow up so incredibly fast that it's like, Oh, okay. Well, I wanted to do that when she was an infant and she is a kindergartner now. And that, that time has passed and it's not anything I'm ever going to like let get in the way. Cause that's just not how things go. But, you know, I do have to take a minute occasionally and reflect and just like, let myself feel like, Hey, it's okay to, you know, feel a sadness for things that won't happen. Um, and then just carry on, um, and do the best that I can in the moment. And, you know, I'm not perfect by any stretch, but it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying. And I know she, that's one of the things I definitely talk about with her. Um, very open about, you know, just, we're all just trying our best and doing our best. And then that's one thing that whether or not it was a conversation I was ready for, uh, just emotionally or mentally. Um, but the, the, you know, these last couple of years have definitely forced a lot of like conversations on just expectations and, uh, you know, safety and, you know, the needs of the many outweighing the needs of the few and just, life got crazy. So when I can do little things like this, and not to say this is a little thing, I, I do realize that being able to even make, have the time and have the support to make these things is a gift and a privilege that I am very grateful for. But when I'm able to do the, the things, big or small, that I can um, for me and for my daughter, it is, it's a big deal and I don't take that for granted. And so I especially don't take for granted the fact that you guys are here, you know, watching me and helping me and being part of this too. Like, so from me and Little Sprout, thank you so very much. Um, I hope that this gives you, you know, peace and, and or creative inspiration and or just a safe place to chill and, you know, hang out with other creatives. And so thank you for helping us do the little things that we want to do. And I hope that you get to do the things that you want to do. So. Thank you very much.
And I also, um, you know, I, I do have a child, as mentioned. Um, we call her Little Sprout in these parts. Um, and so as such, just as a heads up, obviously I will be talking about her um, and my experiences as a human that is also a, you know, has given birth to a child. Um, so please, you know, mind the content tags if any of that is ever upsetting or triggering. There is no shame. Um, I will try and do my best on content warnings, especially if I talk about anything that may be a little bit more on the difficult side. Um, because I want everyone to feel safe here. And if you also have anything that you'd like to share, um, please in the chat, if you are a parent or uh, an aspiring parent or a caregiver or a mother figure or a teacher and you have experiences, I would love to hear those as well. And to those who may be in a more trying time, um, you know, having any sort of difficulty, if hearing even joys of other people's parenting and experiences is difficult. Please mind your mental health. And again, there will never be any shame in not being a part of conversations that are not the right time for you. So please take care of your health and take care of your brain. And hopefully this is on the soothing side and nobody is in any uh, mental health triggering danger here. So thank you. And just again, mind the, I will put up any, uh, if I'm going to talk about anything that could be uh, potentially triggering in that aspect, I will give a warning um, before so. But I do want this to be a safe space for people to talk about stuff, and as such, I will share um, things along the way. So, love you guys, and I want you all to be safe. Okay, so we are almost done. This is coming along really quick. I'm just taking some notes to myself um, on some of these little fiddly bits um, so that I don't keep holding up the same piece and wondering what it goes to because that is definitely something that can happen. Um, oh, that piece is done. Sweet. That one's done. Okay. So we're getting there. It's gone from a neat stack to a hot mess and then almost back to uh, being complete. So. Thanks for sticking with me through this part. I know this may or may not be terribly exciting, but I'm geeking. Um, I'm having fun putting this all together. So hopefully you guys are as well. Uh -huh. It's like a giant puzzle. And once we have this done, we'll actually be cutting into some fabric. So that will be a lot more exciting, I promise. <laughs> Again, please, please feel free to jump on the chat and let me know what you guys are doing, thinking, what you guys are up to on this lovely Saturday. And if it's not Saturday where you are, because I know time zones, I hope it is a lovely day, no matter when it is for you. another piece done. So this is definitely something that I'm, depending on how familiar you are or not with patterns, you might not realize how much goes into just like the prep work of a sewing project. And luckily this is something you only have to do like once per pattern, um, but it is definitely part of the whole sewing process and it really can uh, take a good chunk of time to do this prep work. So. Even with like a store-bought like commercial pattern, um, even just laying out all the big, really fragile uh, tissue paper pieces can take a hot second too. Um, 
So if you're ever sewing, be kind to yourself. And if you're ever asking somebody to sew something like this for you, be kind to them because this is fiddly and yes, it's fun and it's part of it. And you, you know, you learn to expect it and roll with it, but uh, definitely something that uh, takes a little bit more time than I think people expect. But I think that's how it is with any sort of profession is until you've really jumped in and done any of the fiddly bits. We don't really know how long these things take anymore. I think that's one of the cool things about, say, like streaming, um, is the ability to slow down and learn all the process. I was watching somebody with a video about uh, really like an in-depth deep dive into dishwashers the other day. That one was courtesy of my brother. And it was like, yep, I hadn't ever taken a deep dive into the inter- uh, kind of machinations of a dishwasher before, but I learned something and it's like, you know, every single thing around us is designed, um, and made and worked on. And there's a lot that goes into this. So thank you for taking the time and slowing down and chilling with me for a second while we get into the little tiny minutia of paper patterns. say it is really satisfying when you find that last piece. Um, it is like a puzzle. It really is. And I've just about used up all my tape, so I'll have to get some new one. Now the hood is finished, so that is exciting. You can see the whole, the whole hood here. And it's, it's pretty big. Again, this is for a Approximately this well the size that I'm cutting is for a five-year-old child So you can kind of imagine approximately how big that would be you know, kid. This pattern does go all the way up to size six which is the size I'm cutting just because kids do grow very fast um, And I want to make sure that this will actually fit by the time um, I am finished uh, but then also because I am making this out of a thicker material, just inevitably with the quilting, um, I wanted to add in uh, additional uh, bulk, uh, the additional ability to contain bulk. There we go. Uh, because it is thicker. Um, think about putting on like a, uh, a thicker coat under another coat. The, it has to be bigger just to allow for that kind of expansion. Um, so I am cutting it purposely a size larger. And if you're making one for yourself, you will want to do um, the same. And that's something that uh, is another reason to do a mock-up is to make sure that like, like if you're making your own custom clothes, it is a really, really good idea to know what you're going to be uh, like putting this on and over um, because like if you're making yourself like a waistcoat, uh, it's a good idea to make a mock-up and fit it over um, whatever piece you're probably going to wear it the most with, because then you can make sure that it will fit the way you want it to. There's nothing more tragic than uh, getting it very tailored and then having um, like your blouse not fit underneath your waistcoat coat or such like. So that is the benefit and also the downside of making your own clothes is uh, just that sizing. So. It's tricky, but it's worth it. Okay, so I've switched to masking tape just because um, I ran out of scotch tape, so it's a different sound. So there's a lot of little tiny pieces down at the bottom, like uh, this is a yoke, um, and that one is complete in its own pattern. So those, those ones are always kind of a nice bonus, um, but that really shows you how many little tiny pieces there are to this. And what the yoke is, is actually, does this dress have a yoke? This dress it does have a yoke. You can see I'll back up, where there's this extra uh, kind of panel in the back and then it flares out. Um, a yoke on the jacket, which would be easier to show you, but 
I guess I'll just be dorky, um, is this part here. Um, it's this panel right alongside here. And that's for strength, and it's also a design thing. Um, you, if you're doing like, like say like a Bridgerton type dress, um, if you had the yoke in the back, um, then you could have it flare a lot from that part. So you could have it fitted and then flare. Uh, so that's what this is allowing us in the back is that extra little bit of flare, but then also extra construction because that's where um, you're going to be putting on the coat and you want that strength in the back as well. So this was kind of geeking about how well this how well this pattern is constructed gotta slow down um, is because they've taken the time to really um, put in some good finishing details. Look cute that's the pocket um, and give us that that in our pattern. All right so I'm almost 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 done. Um, I think I have a couple more big pieces and then Oh, I just got a question um, about my alerts. There should have been a sound. Um, I apologize about that. I will check that in my OBS. Thank you for the alert there. Um, thank you for all the new followers. This is actually only my second stream, so I'm still getting a little bit of the stuff figured out, so thank you for joining me. And also thank you for your patience. Um, so thank you so much for the new followers. I've got Tissa Girl. Um, and uh, Guru and Kate's. Thank you so much, you guys. I really appreciate it. Oh, that's a square pocket. Okay, so I'm putting aside the ones that I don't need, like at all at all, which are the pockets. And that's not because I'm not putting pockets on, um, but because I'm going to be making my own pocket pattern uh, because I actually want bigger pockets. Um, you know, big brain moment there. It was like, what's better than little pockets, bigger pockets. And it was, in a, it was a design choice as well because these pockets are adorable on the coat. I'll put it up. Um, but the pattern was assuming that you were using whole cloth. Um, so like wool or like a really nice felt or even like fleece. Um, but because I'm going to be using cotton and then I'm going to be quilting it, I'm putting patchwork on the back, but I also figured that was an opportunity to put even more patchwork on the front by doing patchwork pockets. So I will be drafting my own patchwork pocket pattern, um, but uh, spoiler alert, pockets are super easy, especially if they're appliqued on um, kind of in the style that these are. So uh, that one's not a huge uh, worry that I'm not using that pattern piece. And that's something that you can definitely, as you like, get into this, it, you learn what you need and what you don't. There's another pocket pattern. Um, and you can kind of mix and match, and, you know, Frankenstein, if you will, uh, the pieces that you need. A lot of people will take like the bodice from one dress and add sleeves from another. And that's, you know, totally fine. Um, Cause that's part of the creative process um, with sewing and all of this pattern making as well. So. So I am just looking at these last pieces. I believe these are all pockets. I've got these cool curves, um, which actually, since I've got this one up, is an opportunity to show the sizing. Um, again, this is not my pattern. This is Omeo My Sewing's pattern. Um, I've used theirs for their dresses before, but you can see all the different sizes. So they used cute little symbols. Um, I'm cutting on the heart line, which you can't see the hearts because I cut them, but that's the large size. So this is the bottom of the pocket. So you can see all the different sizes they included. Um, for all the different scales, which just really, again, shows how much work and love went into uh, the pattern drafting on this because they made a different size pocket for every different size uh, kid's coat to really make sure that aesthetically that all worked. And that is admirable and is definitely something I would like to commend them on. Um, so, yay, good patterns. All right. So I am just, just, just about finished here and then I will get out my muslin. I do have to iron it, which is something, another part of the process I find endlessly fascinating. I think there, there's so many different parts of sewing. There's the pattern drafting, there's the pattern cutting, uh, then there's the material cutting, the sewing, the finishing details, the ironing, and there's definitely, you know, and major kudos to you if you enjoy them all, but I think there's definitely parts that people prefer more than others. Um, 
and I like to do like the finishing details. I don't mind cutting the stuff out, but like the general construction, I don't, isn't my favorite. Uh, so just like getting it in one piece isn't my favorite part, uh, which is funny because it's actually where you get to really see the progress for the first time. But I think my brain is just at that point, you've put so much in it already and you're just excited and ready for it to be even more finished. And I want to get to the finished details. Um, so then it's like, it just come on brain let's go let's do more um and it's hard to be patient and wait for uh <laughs> wait for the rest of it to come together um but everyone has a different favorite part so if you are a sewist of any sort you can let me know uh what your favorite part is and see if we are similar minded or if we'd actually make a good team because we do opposite parts i think that's uh one of the fun things about sewing with my mom um little sprouts oma is we like opposite parts of the process so we're not fighting each other for the favorite bits and then also I can just be like hey uh, you want to help me on the cutting and she'll be like yeah sure if you do the you know the this that and the other and the zipper uh she doesn't like zippers and I don't mind zippers so I can leverage that when I need help with the parts that I'm not as good at I feel like I'll do your zippers so it's always kind of fun to find yourself a uh, sewing buddy if you can or you know and leverage things. So that is 3E. So the front facing. Okay. So I'm still putting together um, the facings here, which I actually don't entirely need uh, for the mock up. So I may skip those just for now. Obviously, I will have to put them together for the. Um, actual construction of the jacket that's not something I can skip but just to get on with the um, construction of the the mock-up I might boogie on over and uh, skip those ones so I just need a few more pieces and then 3b and 3a I can get going So shout out to my mom. My mom's in chat. Um, and she's, yes, she's talking about, she loves the construction, which is the part I was just mentioning that I don't enjoy as much. So yes, if you've got yourself a sewing buddy that uh, you guys can work together with or help each other out, that's great. Um, but yeah, she is really good with the rotary cutter and the, like, the mats and the, I have a rotary cutter within reach? I don't. Uh, like the mats and the uh, acrylic rulers, and I'm better with scissors. I think there's a big part of my brain that um, is not intimidated per se by exacting precision, but I am a, uh, <clears throat> I do like if I've got seam allowances I can hide in or if things aren't as crucial. Um, I think that's where the whole like, I you know, if I call myself an artist and I, as long as I can make things intentional, in the end it doesn't have to be exacting in the numbers but i i think i think with artists you tend to like stylistically the stuff that you can't do uh, i mean of course there's like common appreciation like hey if you like cottage core aesthetic and i like cottage core aesthetic i'm gonna like your stuff um but like the stuff that i really really gravitate towards um like is patchwork which is not actually what i'm most comfortable doing and so i think that there's a, both a like awe and skill thing um and like as you're making it, you're like oh i like this because i can't make it yet or oh i like this because i know how much went into that and that is just hard but like oh the stuff that i can do oh i know how to do that and i'm not saying you should dismiss it because anything that you can do is beautiful and you should definitely learn to appreciate yourself and that's something i'm working on um just personally as well um but i think just it's like that opposite if you're like really good at drawing organic shapes you might kind of like take a look at what you enjoy from other artists and it might be more on the mechanical side or vice versa um and so then, yes, when you can find a sewing buddy or a friend where you can kind of like swap work in some respects, but also just kind of encourage, uh, you know, like, hey, I'll do the exacting parts if you do the more organic parts or uh, vice versa. So, yes, my mom is um, more on the exacting side. If I need something cut perfectly square and straight, not my forte. So I will exchange work for, you know, organic shapes. Uh, because yes, I am not good 
at that. And that's okay. You know, it's funny, like, you don't have to be good at everything. It's impossible to be good at everything. And that's something that did take me a really long time to be okay with. Um, especially when you're just talking to people who are like, oh, you're an artist, you're, you must paint, you must do pastel, you must do all these things. Like, uh, it's like, no, actually I don't. And I, I, you know, had to get out of my own head for feeling kind of like a failure for that. Um, you know, I can't do everything as hard as that is for me to actually like admit. Um, but also just, I wouldn't now, now I wouldn't want to do everything. Um, I like to do many things. Um, I was never cut from the cloth of a person who could be a master of one thing. Uh, I could go out on a scientific limb and guess that would be the ADHD part of my brain. Um, it's just not made to focus on one thing unless it's a hyperfixation and then that may or may not last. Um, so being a dabbler of many things is important to me, um, but I can't be a master of them all and I never will be. Um, but there is the kind of pride part that's like, but I, what if I could be a master of them all? And it's like, I can't, um, that, that was something I strove for in my youth, but now I know that it's more important to just do work on what I want, cultivate the skills that I want and not worry necessarily about true mastery or even just that illusion of mastery, because as long as I can get done what I want to get done, that's what that's, that's good enough for me. I am not out there to prove it to anybody anymore. It just, it is, I have fun. I like making what I like making. If I need to learn a new skill, I'll go learn a new skill. Uh, but I don't need to, you know, there's no like cold, hard set mastery. I think in my mind anymore, where it's like, oh, if I'm just a master at everything, then that's good enough. It's nah to me. It's more just like I need to get the skills where I can do what I want to do, or trade work if I can't do it, or commission work if I can't do it, and just enjoy the things that I can do because I there's not enough time in the world uh, to do it all. And also, that was a lot of like really unnecessary stress I put on myself. Um, you know, we could talk about, you know, being a, you know, recovering uh, former gifted kid and all that kind of stuff. And then also I'm a late diagnosis, um, like as an adult being diagnosed with ADHD and having to kind of come to terms with the fact with, you know, some of the things I did in my brain that got me perfection or got me mastery may or may not have been the healthiest, like long term, like self care is a super big issue for me. I don't do enough of it. Um, and so just choosing the battles to fight and then also choosing where the energy goes, I think is to me a better goal than just being a master of everything, just to prove that I can do it because now nah, I'm out here to have fun. Now I'm not here to just make things. I'm not, it, I don't owe an explanation or I don't owe proof of skills to anybody anymore. Um, you know, it, I, yeah, I have degrees and yeah, I have accomplishments that I'm very proud of. Um, but I think just being able to just kind of be chill with myself and what I'm using the skills for is actually healthier um, for myself. And please, uh, you know, everyone is on their own journey. Find what makes you proud and what gives you peace. And, you know, again, at the end of the day, if you are not hurting anybody, you make what you need to make and you do what you need to do. But I'm finding for myself personally that I, just, when I focus less on what other people think and like, yes that should have been something I knew, but you know, growth is hard and you do worry about what other people think. Um, and focus more on just being okay with myself, um, is important. So there's my little talk on self-worth and whatever, but you know, I, I think in the art world too, it's very easy to, um, correlate your worth with your productivity. Um, correlate your worth with sales. Um, you know, everyone's like, oh, I open an Etsy shop or, you know, you should sell that. And so then your product, your productivity becomes your self-worth and then your mastery becomes your self-worth and just your like ability to prove, 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 prove what you do and how much you do is when it goes from being a good motivator into being damaging is a, is an issue. Um, like obviously, you know, strive for your best life, push yourself how you need to, but you know, your productivity um, is not your worth. You do not have to produce and sell and be a master and be the best because there is no best. Um, just be you and make what you need to make for you. Um, make sales if you need to make sales. Um, you know, don't worry about ev everyone else's goals or making it into a 
taking it from a hobby and making it into, you know, capitalism. Don't worry so much about that. If you, you know, obviously eat, take care of yourself. Um, if you need to sell things to survive, please do. But when you let just the casual expectations of people to turn everything um, into a race, a competition, a just taking it from being something that was peaceful and self-care and for you and demanding that it become part of you know this capitalist scape that we live in is is just something that I'm trying to really fight back against um you know and I definitely fell into those traps especially when I was younger and starving and you know it's like oh I can make art I can make this my thing and then it is hard to love it because you forget what you got into it for um and then people demand so much and they demand so much for so little um, and that's why, you know, like I said, self-care was something that I'm still struggling with. Um, but I'm trying to definitely get to the point where I'm not only viewing my self-worth on my productivity or the things that I can make and how I can make them for other people. And so that's something that, you know, it took me until I became a mom to realize a lot of this, um, is just how much I gave to other people without really even thinking. And so I'm trying to just bring it back home. For, for me, for her, and to also help her help set healthy boundaries. Um, but then it is hard as someone who is, you know, coming into, like, you know, like I said, adult diagnosis of things that I just thought were pieces of me that were broken and never really had an explanation. Um, and I made, I'm 30, and I made, you know, th up to 30 years of crutches for these things, and now I have an answer but I've got to figure out, okay, what that really means and how can I be healthier for myself and be healthier for my daughter. And, you know, I like, I'm fine. I'm, I've been able to be a successful person. It's not anything that like held me back to the point where I couldn't function or couldn't be like a responsible adult, but it's more of the fact that like, I think we expect burnout. Like it's not even like a Oh, that could happen. It's not a side effect anymore. It's just something that we expect. And as humanity, we deserve better than to just spiral into burnout. Um, so that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about like being healthier and, um, and just helping to set better boundaries and then making sure that my daughter has better boundaries because things change so rapidly. Um, and then like with the explosion of the internet and everything, like just any sort of thing that you did at one point now became public and, you know, it's fun and it's flattering when people say, oh my gosh, you make crafts, you should have an Etsy, but how quickly that can dangerously spiral um, into it becoming your entire, like, self-worth is based on your productivity. So that's, that's what I want, you know, you guys to be aware of and be safe about, as if you are creative, take care of yourself, make sure you set boundaries. And, you know, one of the things I did for myself is... I have a hobby that I refuse to ever monetize. Um, it's something that I can just kind of gloriously suck at in my own time. And uh, that is, I play the banjo and it's just for me. It's just for me and my friends. It's just to jam. It's, you know, but it's still kind of, I can't believe how much that had to feel like rebellion to have something that was not immediately for like public consumption. And that's not just uh, like because I'm streaming. This is even like before I ever uh, got on Twitch or got on YouTube. But like people find out you do something and it just automatically becomes like an expected performative thing. Um, and so, yeah, that was, you know, something I had to like learn to unlearn. So I hope you all are able to practice self-care, good self-care, um, and have boundaries that are healthy. And oh, I wrote the wrong number on this and that's why I've been for the wrong piece this whole time um you know just do something that's just for you um whatever that is if it's drawing if it's painting if it's a musical instrument even if it's you know sitting in a good chair with a good book it doesn't have to be something crazy um just you know self-care is important and don't let anybody take that away from you so. also don't mislabel your pattern pieces and then wonder why you can't ever find a piece And that's the sleeve. Now that that piece that I tried putting somewhere else goes there. I even marked it off. Like, good job, brain. All right. With that piece, we now have the entire sleeve, which is very exciting. That's really where um, 
this quilt is the the quilt coat is um, going to be important in the sizing is especially like around armpits um, like I'm wearing something really really baggy today which isn't the best example for fitting but if all of a sudden this material was like three or four times thicker um, it might be hard to get on and off um, like especially this tailors down to the sleeve if this was thick material this might not be wearable and so that's why I definitely have to make sure um, that I fit this properly um, because I do want this to actually fit when this is all finished so that's why we're making mock-ups that I'm just just about there. Okay. I don't need that one. I'm gonna make myself all these little piles and then wonder what in the world those are later, but that's future me problem. And what's really sweet about this pattern is like the it, it's fully lined uh, the hood has a little lining and the jacket has a lining and so it's gonna be a lot of fabric um, by the time this is said and done and then I'm making each piece three times thicker than it well I guess technically two times thicker uh, than it originally was intended so hopefully this is gonna keep my little bug nice and snug uh, but it's going to be that's the hood lining finished so like I mean you can see that you know you can kind of start to picture what these actually would be this is the hood um, yeah. and you'll see it, it is fun to start seeing like the pieces come together because I think sometimes when it's laid out flat it's a little hard to part of my notes now but it's a little hard to envision um, but when you start seeing like the sleeve like wrap around you're like oh that's the shoulder that makes sense it's really exciting um, that's something that you know comes with just exposure and practice but also just you know kind of that geeky discovery of like oh yeah look look look, look there's the sleeve that's what it looks like okay it's almost done I think Twitch too has also like Twitch and YouTube have reminded me um, too to like trust the process and like slow it down because it's easy in your mind to just be like oh that that took me a day um, you know and like to undersell yourself both if you are you know selling these things monetarily but also just emotionally um, and so like watching other people um, like trust their process and just take the time that it needs it's like yeah no this is gonna take hours. And um, I think we're just used to either seeing things on fast forward or um, not seeing it at all to where it's, yeah, it's hard to envision how fast or slow or not this all is. And so thanks for trusting the process with me today, guys. Like we've been, you know, cutting out a pattern for an hour and a half now, um, but that's how long it takes. Um, and it's nice to not be alone, so. Thanks again for joining me on that part. I'm looking for piece three of B. Three Bravo. That's another reason to hold on to your scraps as well, is I seem to be missing a piece. Now, luckily, this is very easy to extrapolate out. It is just a square, um, because I know that that's uh, going to be a straight line because it's cut on the fold, but it's still odd that that piece went walkabout. But we'll call it done for now because I can extrapolate. I've got the bottom. Um, just, okay, fine, disappear then. <laughs> 
All right, yeah, I've got enough to uh, make a mock-up now. So I will, very carefully, as to not lose any more pieces, uh, gather these guys all up. And sparks. This is exciting because now you get to see it all come together. You can see all these really big pattern pieces. These are all now uh, done and ready to explore. So there's quite a bit of pattern here. Um, all the hood and the sleeve. To give myself a little bit more room, I'm gonna take off my sewing table. Right out. Okay. So this is what we're gonna be using today. Um, this is a muslin, M-U-S-L-I-N, and it is just a whole cloth. Uh, just nice and simple, but it gives us you know, it's going to behave like my feature fabric will. And so that's what we're looking for. We're looking for um, it to, you know, be like our coat, just not. So we're going to lay this out. Let me give myself a little more room. What I'm doing is I'm separating the linings uh, just from the main pieces because I don't necessarily, well, I probably will cut the linings again just so I can kind of simulate um, how thick this is going to be, um, but for now we're just looking at sides. And all of these need two cut out and one of them needs to be on the fold. So I'm going to preemptively fold some fabric. And when you are working obviously with solid cloth, this isn't like solid color, um, whole cloth, this isn't as important, but when you're going to be working with something that has a design, you want to make sure, of course, like that your geese are facing the right way up, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then you also want to pay attention to the way your fabric um, stretches, even like a cotton. Um, now, muslin doesn't really stretch, which is nice. That's kind of why it's perfect for this. Um, but you want to make sure that things are stretching the right way if they need to stretch and they're not stretching the wrong way. Uh, so that's something you will encounter um, if you are doing something. Okay. So this was the one that uh, the little chunk was missing, but it needs to be on the fold, so we'll just keep that straight along the fold. Going to use our paper scissors. We 
are going to grab our fabric scissors. Now this is one of my favorite sounds on this entire planet. And if you're working on a pattern and you ever see uh, these little marks, that means that you're gonna wanna cut a little notch in your fabric on the end of the seam allowance. Uh, these are to line things up. They're especially prevalent on like shoulder seams, um, neck lines, and that just helps when you're kind of in the thick of it and trying to figure out where something goes uh, that you've given yourself little marks. So you can see I just cut oh, just some rudimentary little rudimentary little triangles uh, out right here where those marks are. That'll help me later. It's kind of a gift to your future self. ghost. Slap some eyes on me. Boop, boop. Actually, speaking of costumes, um, did you guys make your Halloween costumes this year? I was talking a little earlier in the chat about how I um, <clears throat> felt like Halloween's already happened because I had to have my daughter's costume done so early because Kid Halloween like starts the first week of October and between play dates and you know a lot of us in pre 2020 stuff but you know it, uh, between the play dates and the trunk or treats and the school this and the you know fall carnival that you kind of have to be ready to have your costume but it's nice because then they don't wear it just the once and then you have all that effort for nothing but it starts early and so because I had to have her costume finished uh, so early I definitely feel like Halloween's already happened um, so my brain was kind of going into winter mode and with it you know kind of the winter holidays and christmas um and i had to resist the urge to do a like yuletide christmas craft on stream today because i at least need to let halloween have its moment we are rushing so rapidly towards you know the endless march of time and 2022 uh that i'm taking a minute to let that have its moment even though my brain was easily excitable about shiny jingle bell uh, nonsense so this quilt coat was actually perfect um i had 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 this on the you know to do list um, but sometimes things get back burnered um, and so i'm glad it made itself known to my brain hole before i skipped ahead in the holidays so it's nice to appreciate the things as they happen instead of rushing uh, rushing these things But speaking of Halloween, since it is this season, uh, if anyone wants to uh, either link or talk about um, what they were for Halloween, uh, that would be super cool. Uh, I'll go first. Um, I made one of those giant pumpkin heads. Uh, it was super fun. It was paper mache. It was ginormous. Um, I went with like a creepy uh, patchwork kind of, you know, vaguely Coraline with like button eyes. Um, you know, trying to find that balance between cute, creative, and creepy. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I wore it out a couple times. It was nice because I felt like I had two masks on, so that was nice and safe. And uh, it was it was really fun. <laughs> so, if you guys made your costumes, let me know. I also made little sprouts. Um, if you guys are gamers, which, you know, we're here on Twitch, so I'll make that assumption. Um, she was Captain Toadette from uh, Tre Toad's Treasure Tracker. So, 
that was cool because not only did she develop my penchants for picking and loving obscure characters, but I then got to make like an alternate outfit for an obscure character. So it was really, really exciting when um, like other kids would recognize her because uh, she definitely wasn't in the main, uh, main, main, main outfit. And that was like, yes. If if things were open back up, it'd be kind of like the perfect costume to wear to like an anime or gaming con, um, just because, you know, target audience and all that. Um, so we used to do a lot of conventions in the before times, and I hope when everyone is healthy and safe, we can get back to some of those fun things um, that we did before. I was talking earlier about um, being a cosplayer um, and how that was both good and bad uh, for learning to sew just because I definitely learned how to take shortcuts and cut corners, and that's not who I want to be um, in my professional work. So, you know, that's character growth. Um, you gotta, you gotta start somewhere, man. So, it's all, it's all good. Okay, so, oops. It would be better if I had pre-ironed this fabric. I've got a couple wrinkles, um, so I'm just stretching that and making sure that's all cut out. Um, but again, this is really just to test fit. So I'm going to sew it together just enough to like get the armpits in, uh, try it on over some other clothes, and call it a day. But what the mock-up will allow is if there is an issue with the sizing, um, I can then add and pin to it and then um, redevelop the pattern if I need to add extra seam allowance etc etc so it's not wasted effort um and then if i develop a good pattern out of it and i know that it fits then that's just extra good especially like if you're making clothes for somebody that won't change size as rapidly as a small growing child um having a nice kind of mock-up of just like basic construction clothes for like I'll, I'll say like for yourself as example um then you can just use that as your base pattern um, instead of always kind of having to guess at the size on the tin or if you've like like for me I have really big shoulder blades um, and so it's hard for me to find things that like stretch out in the back um, and then being like small chested in the front it's like I need more fabric in the back than I do in the front and so finding a pattern that fits that um, is difficult and then I often do have to do quite a bit of tailoring um, so it is definitely one of my goals to um, have a like basic blouse pattern for myself mocked up and like a basic dress um, so that I don't have to like reinvent the wheel every single time I want to sew because that gets that gets exhausting um, and so I'd say with anyone that like doesn't fit the pattern right out of the box um, maybe take the time if you know like you're gonna be doing a lot of sewing take the time and develop that um, and like I say, I say that with a, take that with a grain of salt. It's something I need to work on too. Um, but you know, maybe we can do that as together as goals, um, just develop something that fits us so that we don't have to, like I said, reinvent it every single time and kind of just deal with the either, um, like for me, there's a lot of dysmorphia that comes when I just don't fit the thing right out of the box. And that's partially gender presentation. And that's also partially, like I said, just being very flat chested and then having larger shoulder blades. Um, in the back, it's almost like the garments would fit better, like where like boob cups and stuff would go if I was to just put them on backwards. Um, it's just, yeah, I don't need to face that every single time. I just want to make like a little blouse. So um, for, again, mental health sake and body positivity sake, uh, if you're going to do a lot of sewing for yourself, I think that would be a good place to start would be making just like a U pattern, um, a basic shirt um, and or dress depending on how you want clothes and just being able to work from that and then of course you can buy specialty patterns to you know get ruffles and add-ons and everything but yeah just just because you know you want a shirt doesn't mean it's always worth uh, dealing with the dysmorphia that comes from not being exactly like the pattern envelope or presenting differently so again stay healthy out there everybody and you know make it work for you i've got my cord right where i am cutting and that is not smart so <laughs>
I'm going to cut out um, one more piece, and then I'm going to take a very quick coffee break, but I will leave everything on. I just, I'm tethered to my cords right now, and my coffee is just slightly out of reach. Um, what's cool about the bus, um, and I, I will do a bus tour um, very soon, uh, maybe not in this stream, but very soon, um, is the bus is not only, it's about a the bus is about 105 square feet, and like I said, Art is a short bus, and not only is the bus home to my studio, my studio practice where I make my art, uh, but Art also got an upgrade this year um, with everything going on and uh, having a kindergartner in the mix. Um, it became our homeschool classroom as well. So the back half of the bus is where I homeschool my daughter, and the front half is where I do my art practice. But I was slightly distracted coming in today and I left my coffee on her desk and it's just far enough away that it's off stream <laughs> and I'll have to go grab it. Um, so let me get one more piece cut out and set a goal for myself of cutting out this last piece and then I will reward myself with coffee. Because I do know if I wander off right now I will forget to cut out this hood. And I don't want to forget to cut out the hood because this is the pixie hood and I'm very very excited to see how it uh, actually comes together. So, powering through the distractions to get to the exciting bits. Let's see if that's big enough. So what I'm doing here is I'm just adjusting where I'm putting the fold, um, just to cut two of these out at the same time and get the best economy out of my fabric. I did flip this pattern. Um, if you, the, so if you notice that, good eye. Uh, don't worry because one, there's no right and wrong side of this fabric, and as long as I get two pieces that are uh, symmetrical, it doesn't matter which way my pattern is facing in this moment, um, but if you were doing this on your final fabric, do be aware of the way that your pattern pieces are facing, um, both with the direction of your piece, like the pattern, uh, you wouldn't want upside down geese or anything, and then also with, uh, like, is it the outside of the sleeve or is it, you know, the hood? So that's why I'm turning that one around, but again, grain of salt on that one just because this is the mock-up, and to make sure that you are uh, safe and careful with your uh, positioning on your final garment. Because I've definitely dorked that up before where I've uh, laid a pattern piece wrong and I end up with like two left sleeves or, you know, like normally a sleeve is symmetrical, but I've had garments where they, they weren't and I ended up with two of the same one because I flipped the pattern piece around to get more fabric economy. And, you know, it's kind of like, ah, that was smart in theory, but not in practice. Um, so yeah, make sure that you're getting the right pieces and the right number of pieces um, instead, of, and then additionally the best fabric economy. Because a little bit of fabric waste is inevitable. That's just um, how this industry goes. That's just how this um, happens. What you can do is save it and use it to like stuff plushies and stuff with. Um, or if it's like 100% cotton and you do live out in a rural area, you can use it for like fireplace fire starters. Um, there are different schools of thought on giving it to birds for bird's nests. I would uh, contact your local uh, ornithologist and uh, see if that's okay in your local area. But there are ways to recycle it. But just, you know, don't get, you know, don't despair. There will be a little bit of fabric waste and we just do the best that we can to mitigate that. But what's more important, I think, is using your fabric. I'd say use it for the project first and then use it wisely for the yardage. Um, there's a there's a concept in like quilting especially called fussy cutting where I think it's a better use if you're only going to be using two inches of this fabric to make sure that you actually like get a full goose then just worry about fabric economy where you might just get like that instead like that doesn't do much for the project but if you cut it a little bit better and got like geese heads it does so use for the project first, then use for like economy of fabric, and then just be wise with your scraps, and then it, you know, it, you can get away with, you know, maybe wasting a little bit to get a better like composition. So, okay, I now have all the pieces cut out. So I am going to switch uh, just to my BRB screen, and um, 
grab my coffee and I'll be right back. Um, but chat is still up, so please uh, join in the chat if you would like, and I'll be right back. There we go. All right. I hope you guys got a snack if you needed a snack. I got myself some coffee. Oh. I had to eat a quick molasses cookie because it is fall, even if it's 80 degrees. So I had myself a nice little treat, and now I've put my sewing machine table back together, and I'm going to boot her up. So what I am doing um, is I have all of my plain pieces cut. I had to add back in the yoke. I hadn't actually cut that one. Um, but what I'm going to do is just put the basic pieces together um, and just make sure that it's looking like it's supposed to. I mean, this is definitely a uh, pattern that's been very, very tested. Um, but, you know, make sure it uh, fits for the purposes that I need it and then try it on. And in this case, try it on the client and go from there. So I'm going to start putting it together. Um, now, one of the things you will always want to do is check your pattern for what size seam allowance you're using. And I'm using a half inch on this one per the instructions. But a seam allowance is what you, the distance that you give between where you're sewing and like where you're sewing and the edge of your fabric. The greater the seam allowance to a point, um, the stronger your garment. Uh, the less seam allowance, the more fragile because when you pull on your stitches, it could unravel. So you want to give yourself a decent amount, but more importantly, you want to read your pattern if you are using a pattern because they will have built that into all the proportions. And if you start messing around with the seam allowance, uh, you could have the proportions be off. Um, so read your box or your, uh, read the labels in the pattern appropriately. Um, but when you're making your own, what's most important would just be consistency. Like that's why, like if you're quilting, traditionally you just use a quarter inch and you stick with it the entire project because then it's just, it's just what it is. Uh, quarter inch seam allowance all the way around, call it a day, uh, keep it even, keep it simple, um, just go from there. Uh, but garments, um, most of the time, the pattern that you'll buy, like, um, from Joann's or Michael's, will be five-eighths of an inch seam allowance. Um, this one is a half inch. So, uh, measure that, and I, I like to mark it on my machine, um, where I'm sewing, but a lot of times they will have a little mark. Um, but yeah, just remember your fractions and go from there. So, half inch is actually the edge of my foot while I'm sewing here which is nice. Uh, it's always nice when things just work out. So I am going to start sewing these and uh, put it together. So for the design, um, what would be really cute is if you were using like all whole cloth is you could like do a color block thing with this yoke being a separate piece. Uh, what I am planning on doing is having the yoke be uh, corduroy, which is what I'm going to be using for the front of the coat. And then this whole back piece, the big kind of relatively square, save for the armpits, is going to be patchwork. Um, so we have a big old great big book of everything um, over here that I'm going to be uh, pulling a pattern from and making it patchwork. Um, again, not going to spend the time making it patchwork uh, for my mock-up, um, but as long as my finished piece of patchwork is larger or equal to my pattern size, it'll just integrate nicely. So that's the yoke with the back. And then what I'm going to do is take the front of the coat. And, you know, keep your pattern pieces nice because we will have to do this again. Um, I'm going to put them right sides together. So you'll, if you're not already familiar, you're going to hear 
right sides together and wrong sides together a lot in the sewing world. And what that means is with normal fabric, here, I'll grab some. You've got your right side, which is like your pretty patterned, like why you bought the fabric side. And then you have your wrong side, which is the back of the fabric. And some fabrics don't actually have a back and a front if they're just like solid or depending on how they're dyed. But like with this, for the most part, um, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, you're gonna want this like on the inside of your garment and you're gonna want what you like paid for and why you got the fabric and what the artist intended on the outside. Uh, this becomes important when you're making seams because you want all your seams to be on the inside. So you want the good side sewing and then the seams on the inside. So like with this piece, where I've already got the uh, yoke stitched on, this now is the right side of the fabric because it's got the clean seam. Whereas on the back, I've got the seam with the seam allowance, like that becomes the wrong side of the fabric. So this is the right side. Um, so when I put right sides together, um, I'm gonna make sure that like, if this was my real fabric, that I'm not doing like one wrong and one right uh, to where my like seam is all funny. Um, so that's what that means is right, right and wrong sides of the fabric. And it's just, you know, shorthand to kind of keep it all, um, like easy, but you'll, you'll definitely see it like in pattern, um, in patterns and then in pattern lingo, as you start to pick up like sewing tips and techniques is yeah, right and wrong sides. That's a good place to, good place to start. So on this one, I am going to pin because I'm sewing it along the side seam and then uh, along the shoulder seam as well. And I don't want that angle to change. Uh, shoulders are notorious for just being slightly off angle. And I'm trying to get an accurate representation of what this is going to be like. So I'm actually going to pin this one. A lot of times I don't pin and I probably should. Um, but like I said, we're all, we're all growing here and learning. So, so again, half inch seam allowance. I'm also not bothering to tie knots, um, which is called tacking on a sewing machine. I am not tacking uh, because this is just a mock-up, and chances are, if I need to do anything, um, it's like chances are if it's if it's gonna need to be ripped up or resized. I don't want knots in my way, like anything that's gonna slow me down. Um, now, again, this pattern has been. Uh, like play tested. I can't think of a sewing term there, but yeah, this is, this has been play tested. This has been, uh, you know, made lots of times. So I don't expect any problems with this, but I also don't need to be my own problem. So I'm not going to add extra knots or extra security in this. I'm just zipping this together. Okay. So now if I was to turn this out, you can see how the seam for the yoke is now pretty and the seam for the side and the seam for the shoulder. And like, it's already coming together. Like this is almost a vest. It's, it's passable. It, it resembles a vest. I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing on the other side. And then we will zip the sleeves together and then put the sleeves in. So lining up my shoulder. And you're really just trying to keep your edges kind of as close, like assuming that you cut it out nicely, and I've got some parts which aren't, which is why I uh, did put that caveat. Um, you're really just trying to keep your edges um, aligned because that's what the pattern was, that's what you're basing the seam allowance back off of. Um, that's what helps with pinning too, is if you know that you've got some funky edges in there, um, you know, just helps keep it a little bit more straight. Same on the 
shoulder seam. And remember to watch that angle because it won't necessarily, here's what's to me the trickiest part about garment stitching versus quilting. With quilting, ultimately the goal is everything lays flat. Like it's a blanket, it's gonna be flat. It's either hanging on a wall or it's, you know, flat. With sewing garments, you're sewing for the 3D human form. And so like even in something like this little shoulder seam and side seam here, if I hold the side seam and start smoothing out my fabric to get it flat, my shoulder pieces are not anywhere near where they like be uh, in 2D space. But when I align them up and then sew them, it builds in body and obviously that's what we want we're sewing for the human body um but it is odd because then like if it's if you're laying it it's clumpy and it can be kind of a, a little bit alarming when you're first sewing because you've all of a sudden got like folds and lumps and bumps and it doesn't lay smooth anymore and you're like but it should lay smooth but no it shouldn't the shoulder's gonna lay where it needs to lay the side seam's gonna lay where it needs to lay and that's a good thing but it still trips me up like to this day it's like oh no it's not flat but no it's for it's for a person not a paper so okay so look if we were to like this can sit on a like hanger now it's wrinkly but it is a vest. You could put it on a small human. So I'm going to set that to the side for two seconds and reach for my sleeves. If I had to pick my least favorite thing um, when it comes to sewing garment construction, it's sleeves. Uh, not the actual like arm part of the sleeve, but the armpit part. They are, it's it's a lot of mental gymnastics because we were talking about like right side and wrong side, but then you've got like a tube that has a seam, but then you need it flipped inside and you need to sew it, but then it has to be able to come back out. And then like when you get garments that are lined, uh, it gets a little bit kind of funny. So the, the best way I have been able to visualize things is actually just look at your own clothes. Um, like imagine, like turn a shirt inside out and then see how they would have like connected the dots. Um, that was a big thing for me was like just examining, um, garments that were already made and like, you know, in every sewing, every garment sewing community that exists, like you'll hear, um, like historical costumers talk about like extant, uh, historical garments and extant just means they still exist. Um, extant historical garments and they'll, you know, look at construction methods and this, that, and the other. And partially that's because we're genuinely uh, curious about how people did things now and back then but it's also just yeah like it is the best way to like really kind of take it apart mentally without having to take it apart is to examine all the parts that were put together um, you know the seam lines and such because that's really how you're telling um, you know their thought process and then how you would go about like recreating it um, so yeah take a look like turn a short inside out um, and see where, like, see how they got all the seams in there. Uh, some garments, they'll sew the, the uh, sleeve and the uh, um, side seam, like, all in one swoop. Others, it's separate pieces. This one's a separate piece. Um, but especially, too, like, depending on the size of your garment, the technique can change. Uh, one of the things I love to make, watch people make are little tiny doll clothes. Like, you know, like, monster high Lolita dresses where, like, the torso's this big and the sleeves are... And it... it blows my mind like I can do that on this scale but like how when you're working in that scale where like your seam allowance is almost just as much fabric as you're putting like in the whole garment like that still absolutely blows my mind so it's fun to watch people make things And if you guys have um, questions about equipment, anything that I'm using, I will make an FAQ uh, post just so that, you know, it's all there. But I'm happy to answer things about sewing machine questions or, you know, thread preferences or any of that. Okay, 
So I am going to actually really quickly glance your sleeves right side out and your garment inside out. Okay, at how they are doing it. So the way that the pattern's written, we're going to take our sleeve and turn it right way out. So that means put that seam on the inside and have the right side of our fabric in our tube. So when we do that, we get what looks like a wrinkly little sleeve. And so you can see now that big piece uh, sewed up became the sleeve and then this is the curve that will sit the shoulder and the armpit. Uh, so that's that's a sleeve. We made a sleeve, guys. Um, so I'm gonna do that with the other one. With something this big, you can stick your hand in and just kinda, you know, turn it inside out. Um, when you're working with little pieces, um, you might want like a chopstick or a blunt end of a pencil or my favorite, which is medical grade forceps, but you know, you do you. So two sleeves. Okay, so now these are both right sides out, which means you can see that the seam is nice and clean. All that like messy seam allowance nonsense is on the inside. I'm gonna tuck that away. Good sleeves. And we're gonna take our garment and turn it inside out. And what that does, and this is the mental gymnastics I was talking about, is when we then put our sleeve inside the inside out garment, we are putting right sides together. Um, and a good way to check that is actually to, um, like look at your seams um, and you want like seam allowance and then you've got your flat part of your good fabric and then the seam allowance and your back part. And imagine you're making a sandwich and just make sure that like your stuff's facing the right way, if that makes any sense. Um, so then we're gonna go ahead and get that pinned up. Um, you wanna make sure that you pin the heck out of this because it's gonna slip slide. Uh, if you're sewing on a curve and you're sewing in a tight space. So this is where you want to pin. Um, there's definitely times where you can get away with it and times you can't. Also, uh, a tip of the trade, whenever you're sewing with something that is a curve, um, one, look for the notches that you probably cut earlier, and two, I like to preemptively fold it in half and mark center. This will 9.999 times out of 10 match up with like your top seam. And that just gives you like a good idea that you're kind of spacing it around evenly. Now, if your pattern has notches, remember those um, tri oops, sorry. those triangles that we cut out earlier, these guys, you want to match those up first, like primarily. And then if other things happen to match up like the center of your, um, the center of your uh, circle there, then that's a bonus. Uh, but do your notches first and then go around. So here are my notches. Uh, this one I just cut a rhombus, and then the other one I did cut both uh, triangles out of it. If you can see that, I know it's light on light on light on light. Um, but you're just making sure that those match up because that's what the pattern maker's telling you is important to pay attention to, um, is getting those in those spots. And that could be, one, just for ease of making the pattern easier to follow. That could also be to make sure, like, you know, that you're getting a good range of motion. Um, so yeah, be be aware of those um, and then use use the clues that you're given um, by the pattern maker and then use your intuition um, because especially on a good tested pattern they know what they're doing so keep on pinning so yeah so my center top didn't actually end up being right on top and that's okay it was still worth marking just to kind of see um, and then sometimes, and you'll also want to make sure you read your pattern, sometimes a sleeve will be gathered uh, to make it fit, so you'll get a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a gather here, um, especially like with fancier clothes or historical clothes, you'll get a gather. This one doesn't, um, and that's because this is, this pattern is made to be uh, made out of a thick fabric, so you wouldn't really gather up like a, a wet wooled uh, felt or like a really thick velvet uh, because otherwise your seam is going to be chunky um, so just you know make sure you're reading the instructions oops and go from there all right so i've got one sleeve in i'm going to go ahead and sew this one so that if i've messed it up i don't have to unpick two sleeves um, but yeah so you can see that you're kind of fighting this in a small space let me move this cam down So you've got your your shoulder and you're going to be sewing in a curve 
but you gotta what you're what you're gonna do is you're gonna just lift up your sewing machine foot and just find a good place to kind of ease yourself in um, I like to keep my pins on top um, so I can pull them out and then lock your foot down get your first pin out of the way and go from there okay. now when you're sewing a sleeve I'd say the most important part is to go slow and with your fingers you're really gonna feel to make sure that you're not like sewing the sleeve like back um, in on itself or anything you want to make sure everything's kind of tucked out of the way um, because nothing's worse than getting the sleeve in perfectly except for the fact that you like grabbed the elbow in this seam um, so just yeah take it nice and slow and see I'm sewing slightly upside down right now so this way and you know like Figure out what's comfortable. If you start sewing from an angle and it's not working for you, take it out. Uh, I didn't like the way that that was feeling, so I'm reloading this back on my machine. Put my foot down and going, uh, going again. Just, just keep working it around nice and slow. You want to make sure you don't gather up anything or pinch anything that isn't supposed to be pinched um, because then you'll be unpicking in a weird small space. But again, not the end of the world. Like, every sewist uses their seam ripper. It's not, it, it happens. You, you didn't break anything. So. Apparently it's been a trend to name your seam ripper. Uh, a lot of Jack the Rippers out there. Um, so I'll have to come up with a name because I haven't actually named my seam ripper. But yeah, look look at that. We've got an attached sleeve. You can put it, put it on. And that one actually worked out really well, um, which makes me very happy because it's nice to have success, successes. So about that, speaking of, just as soon as something goes right, the universe is like, hey, don't get cocky. Perfect. So I'm going to do the other one and that's actually maybe where I'll leave the stream today. Um, what I want to do before I come back is uh, gather up all my references for the patchwork and relay that out. Um, and I also think you guys have been absolute champs during all of the pattern cutting out and construction. Um, so I will come back and do the rest of the coat on a second stream. I am going to put this up on a VOD channel, so if you are into video on demand, uh, check out my YouTube. I'll, um, it's going to be Art Schooly VOD, and you can again find me anywhere at CatherineStockingLopez.com, or no, just CatherineStockingLopez, also.com, and at Art Schooly. So between those two names, that is me, that's the bus, that is what we do here. So thank you for joining me. Um, feel free to stick around to the end of the stream where you will probably uh, go raid. And uh, thank you guys for being here. And remember, we are here on Art Schoolie and the bus's doors are always open. You are always welcome on board the bus. And thank you for being here and thank you for being you. So I really appreciate uh, all the new followers. Thank you guys. And let's uh, keep making a coat together. course uh, if I could have a superpower that wouldn't be able to like save the world um, if I had to have a power that was mildly useless 
um, except for in like really weird creative specific situations. It would be the power to duplicate things, but because no power comes from just anything and has to have something, I would have to still put in the work first. So like, for example, in sewing, I've done one sleeve. I had to, uh, you know, I had to do it. I had to piece it. I had to learn. I had to have it go right. And the power would just be to duplicate that same work I've done. Because yes, no power comes without cost or uh, skill or whatever. So that would be my semi-useless but really, really, really handy superpower would be the ability to duplicate things I've already done. Because, yeah, sure, if I had the, the ability to duplicate anything, then you start getting into very, like, chaotic uh, superpowers and, you know people it could be very morally gray you could duplicate money you could duplicate things you could also save the world duplicate um, medicine duplicate whatever um, and that would be cool like that would be nice to just be able to allocate resources uh, appropriately but if I couldn't save the world and just had like a casual superpower um, that would be really really handy although if I could pick any superpower that would be both useful to me and to people around me be the ability to start and stop time you know just for a handful of seconds like you see somebody about to get like in danger you could just snap time fix it go back um you know just and then you could of course just get five extra minutes of sleep here and there i think that's definitely me being a parent showing um but yeah i don't know superpowers like, teleportation and stuff would be super cool, but, like, we have answers to that. Like, yeah, instant teleportation, if we could get there as a society, would be neat. Um, but I think, like, not that anyone gets to pick their mutant superpowers, but if one could, there would be some cool things. Okay, so, just getting this other sleeve on right now. The first one went really well, so I am cautiously optimistic for the, the second. However, um, you know, there's no guarantees in life and there's no guarantees in crafting. So, so I'm going to hold my breath for this one coming out nice. that it puckered it turns out it didn't all right so yep this is why we don't get excited i sewed that one on inside out however it looks really nice but i do still have to unpick it <sighs> um but you know that's what happens so yeah this one's completely inside out which i'm going to show you guys i did not do this as a teachable moment but i will not pass up the teachable moment this sleeve the first one is perfect you can see uh, all the seams are good, everything's facing the right way, and then this one, the uh, seam allowance is on the outside. So that's no bueno. What we're going to do is we're going to unpick that and re-sew it, which is a bummer because I didn't pucker or gather anywhere and it looks really good. But alas, what can you do? So just grab a little handy pair of scissors and... And I don't have to be that careful with this fabric, so you will hear rips because it's a rule of thumb is you don't want to use th uh, thread that's stronger than your fabric. This is so that when, if, if and when a seam rips, only your thread rips because if it's weaker than the fabric around it, it's going to be the weakest link in the chain. It's going to break before your thread rips. If you use a thread that is stronger than your fabric, it will pull and actually damage the fabric itself, um, which then is a, it's a harder repair. It's not impossible, but it's a harder repair. So if you can look at you know your thread and make sure that it's you know equal to or weaker um, than your fabric, just for that, um, that for that sake. We're gonna try that again. And that's, that's, this is kind of a good stopping point too. Um, not only because obviously I made a mistake, which definitely happens. I mean, if I stopped every time I made a mistake, I wouldn't be doing anything. But, you know, 
there's also the I've been going for a couple hours now and it is good to give the old brain cage a break so what I will do is I will get the sleeve back on properly just so that I don't leave it half finished um, but then what I can do is take this moth up and make sure that it fits uh, my daughter and then when I come back I can work on the actual coat because then I'll know if I need to make any adjustments to the pattern and then we'll be able to go on with the fun part which is putting geese all over this thing so What you can also do too, um, as you, if you pin well enough, you can kind of use the pins as a temporary seam and you can look around at your garment and make sure that it is facing in the correct direction. So that's why pinning is also important. Um, yeah, but like I said, even people make mistakes, it happens. So I did that wrong again. And that's why we want to test it sleeve right side out, garment inside out, see? That's, that's that duplicating thing, because I obviously did the first one, but what happened? Okay, sleeve right side out, garment inside out. Sleeve through the hole. All right. All right, third time's the charms, guys. We are going to get this right. And yeah, that's this is kind of that like uncertainty valley where it's like, oh my goodness, I can't even put it on a sleeve. But I know I can, and mistakes happen. And also just, now we had a teaching moment. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there we go. All right. Happy to see you guys chatting in the chat. Okay, cool. There we go. All right. So, again, lining up those uh, angled points is very handy. And then making sure we just follow that around and getting it nice and smooth because we don't want any ripples or pinches um, in this because that's just gonna make it look nicer feel nicer and I don't know about you guys but I'm um, like I have a seam sensitivity so like I don't like it when there's stuff hanging out in the seam where it's not supposed to be and you know if seams are in the wrong place they really bother me so you know I try when I'm making my own clothes to uh, honor that and you know not make something that's gonna be um, sensitivity triggering but then also just try and make them as nice as I can because no one's grading or judging but it's still nice to just you know put my best foot forward and and be like hey I really tried on this you know it's not perfect I sewed the sleeve on backwards but I'm putting my best foot forward all right third time being the charm let's get this sleeve on Nice and slow, no bumps, no lumps. from you guys. All right, whew, it's a sleeve. It's a sleeve. Okay, so you can see, like, it's it's a jacket. It's it's a little tiny little jacket. It's super cute. All right, it's got a yoke. It's got two sleeves facing the right way, and it is technically wearable. Now, this isn't going to do much in the way of warmth, um, so that's where the quilting and everything's going to come in, but it is functionally, technically, 
a wearable garment. So this is where I'm going to stop the stream for today. Thank you so much. So much, so much for joining me today. Uh, this was super fun. Thanks for uh, sticking through all the pattern, uh, learning about the pattern and everything with me. And I am going to work on the patchwork on our next time. So I hope you guys join me for that. Again, I'm Catherine. We're in Art Schooly. The bus's doors are always open. And I really hope you guys had fun and I will catch you around. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put it on an end screen and then we are going to raid another chat. So I hope you guys stick around for that and uh, let's see what random creative we can go raid and hopefully they have a great stream as well. All right. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you next time. Bye.